Thank you all for coming along and joining us today. So for those of you that don't know me, I'm just going to admit a few more people here. Um, my name is uh, James Simcock and I'm a surgeon at South Paws in Melbourne, Australia. And we are here just to um, have a chat about a few different surgical cases. We've got a few things, some slides to go through and, and have a discussion point. Um, but really, if you have any questions, or if you want to chat about anything surgery related, we can certainly go through that stuff. Now, the Q&A sessions, we've set these up for um, a learning platform that Charles Quince and I have established called Vet Dojo. And so can I just get an indication from um, the people that are um, on here about um, who has actually purchased a course from Vet Dojo? Um, just want to get a handle on what you guys think of it. And if you have any questions or comments, um, Dylan. Yeah. How do you do that? You can just shout it out. Just talk to me. Yeah, Dylan, do you want to? Have you got anything you want to talk to me about? I'll unmute you there. I got the um, the FHO course. That was the first one I got. FHO course. Yeah, hey, that it's great. Yeah, that's good. Um, anyone else there that's joined in the courses? Friends, um, where are you from, friends? So just take your cue. I'm from James Cook in Townsville. In Townsville, nice to meet you. I yes, don't think I've met you in person. No, no. Okay. Yeah, joining us as well. So a few other people joining in. And has anyone got any kind of comments um, <clears throat> about the learning platform so far? Any other comments? Okay. If not, um, if think about any comments you have, and you can certainly just jot them down in the chat section or um, just through to us at um, Dojo. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, um, and we'll get into the topics that we're going to talk about. <clears throat> so it should come up. So can you guys see my um, iPad screen there? Give me a thumbs up. Thanks very much. So going to go through a few different cases. So um, the first one I wanted to go through was just a case that we saw last week. It's a, a condition that we see um, quite commonly um, in these little guys. And it's a condition known as Pes virus. Um, and we see this not uncommonly. It's a condition that seems to be limited to dachshund breeds um, in particular. I don't think I've seen it in the other breed. And the situation that we have is we have this really um, severe angulation in the hock and we have the long axis of the tibia here, and then we have the hock um, angulation here, which is abnormal. And this can create quite a lot of um, dysfunction and um, mobility issues for these guys. Um, so I'm just trying to see more of your faces in here. Yeah, so it can create quite a lot of um, mobility impairment for them. and. We see this often in dogs as they're getting to kind of split maturity. Owners notice that the gait's not quite right um, and they're um, having various, various degrees of impairment. Some of these guys are, are quite lame um, and have quite a lot of dysfunction. Some of them, when it's bilateral, kind of have just a funny wobbly gait um, as they move around. So um, the problem is limited just to that angulation in the hock and um, it is something that we see commonly in can so I just wanted to run through, I know that um, through Vet Dojo and um, through our YouTube channel, a lot of people talk to us about um, angular limb correction, how we address that um, and what the different options are. So I thought I'd just run through some of the stuff on PES virus specifically, how I manage these, how I plan them out um, and the different options that we've got. So this is the case that we saw last week and on the x-rays that we've got here, again, we can note that you've got the long axis of the tibia here and we've got this angulation made by the, um, the hock. And the Cora, so looking at the Cora methodology, the center of rotation of angulation methodology, we can use that to kind of plan these guys out. Um, but I'll do it in a bit more of a, a basic fashion. I'll explain that in a, in a second. With any deformity, you can't um, break or if you're in a pelvic limb deformity, the ability to be able to plan the correction and execute the correction well and accurately um, really, really depends on um, 
your ability to take really nice images, um, either with x-rays or in, in our case, we're often doing CT scan for the other element, whole other network. Um, accuracy to that and detail. So I'm just gonna go ahead and mute everyone. If I can work out to do that. So, guys, if you are there, I'm just having a hard time working out how to uh, get all these things muted. I just go through individually and all you know, there. That's great. Okay. And this will make So, so I just need technology here. So just working this out myself a little bit. So I do excuse the gathering, dilly gathering around. So getting an accurate plan really depends on getting nice X-rays and, and nice straight X-rays. And, and what I often do when I'm taking either um, an antibrachial X-ray or a, a pelvic and X-ray is I want to focus on the joint above the angulation that's normal and get that joint nice and straight on the x-rays and then we can let the, the bottom of the leg uh, kind of just sit up and fit. So in this case, we're going to look at um, the stifle joint. We're going to get um, the stifle joint nice and straight on our x-rays on a, a lateral view on an AP view. And then we're going to let the remainder of the leg just sit as it is so we can actually see what the deformity looks like. Um, in this situation, we've got the right leg here and then we've got the left leg here on the same patient. You can see quite clearly that there is an angulation there. If you look at the long axis of the tibia, we can see that when we line it up with the metatarsals, those, um, those metatarsal bones are essentially parallel to the long axis of the tibia. So when we get into surgery with this guy, what we're going to try and emulate is getting those metatarsal bones here in line with the long axis of the tibia down here. And this dog actually had an internal rotation I appreciated um, on his x-rays and on his clinical exam. So we actually went ahead and we did a CT scan on this guy as well, just to further try and characterize what's going on with those legs. And I put this image of the CT scan in here. This is a three-dimensional reconstruction that we can do on the images. And this allows us to um, really carefully assess the limb. We can rotate this around. I'll show you some 3 reconstructions in a moment um, and really plan carefully what we need to do for correction. So with this um, particular case, I'm going to flip over to a different program here called VPOP Pro. So VPOP Pro is a planning software, an orthopedic planning software that I've been using quite a lot of recent times. Um, it's out of the UK. It's a really nice planning software. And essentially, you can import an X-ray image onto any platform. So this is on my iPad. You can import it onto your desktop. You can import it onto your phone. Um, you don't actually have to import the file. You can use the program and just hold it up to your computer screen and take a photograph of the computer screen, um, and then you can use that image um, to actually make your plan. So we started using this a lot for TPLOs, and I think it, it does a really nice job. So with this program, I've already put a couple of um, lines in here, but you can actually um, just go ahead and remove those lines so I can kind of show you how to put those in there. So just delete that and delete that. And then we come up here, we can put a new line in. So we can drag these lines around, we can move them um, and adjust as we need to. Incidentally, we do have calibration markers on here, so we can calibrate this X-ray um, to the appropriate size. So um, I've already gone ahead and done that. For this, I'm not making any measurements necessarily, um, and so I don't need to have the calibration markers on there, absolutely, but if I'm doing something like a TPLO, or if I'm gonna plan like how much of a wedge I'm gonna take out, so if we were to do a closing wedge osteotomy on this case, um, then we would, we would wanna calibrate it. But for most of these situations, we're gonna do an opening wedge osteotomy for these pairs of RS pages specifically. So we can look at here and we can actually plan how much of an angulation we've got by moving these lines around. And if we line um, this distal segment up um, with the metatarsals, we can actually see that we've got an angle here of 151.5 degrees. And if I click on that, we can actually see the corresponding angles depending on um, the area that we're looking at. So um, it's a really, really nice and easy um, planning software to use. So with this guy, we actually um, can then um, plan a little bit about how we're going to do this surgery. And as I just mentioned, we're going to do an opening wedge osteotomy in this guy. So 
we're going to um, just cut out this bottom section of the legs. I'm going to start over here on the lateral cortex. I'm going to move this across as if that's my osteotomy. So we're going to do a transverse osteotomy as far distal as possible because the core in this guy, the center of rotational angulation is very distal. And I'm going to drag this um, cutting tool around and I'm going to let it go there and get done. And then what I can do is actually emulate that opening wedge osteotomy. And so I can get an impression of, you know, how far I need to actually open that wedge. Um, so I can take a measurement of that gap and we can, we can take that into the operating room. The other thing I can do is that depending on if I put my osteotomy line at the level that I'm going to make um, or put my plan line where I'm going to actually execute the surgery, I can get the impression of if, if I'm going to induce any translation in this particular case because the problem with the core methodology, I'm not going to go into the full details of that, but the core of this dog is probably going to be lower down closer to the joint. And because I'm making my cut essentially away from the core, it means that when I actually rotate that segment of bone, I'm going to end up with a small amount of translation. So I can actually assess a little bit about how that's actually going to look in this particular case. So um, it's kind of neat software. I just wanted to show that to you. It's something that's out there. It's um, readily available and, and I think it's a, a really nice planning tool um, for all kinds of orthopedic um, procedures. Has anyone got any questions about that um, at the moment? I'm just trying to see if I can get the comment section. So. Thanks guys for bearing with me. I'm just trying to do you take a wedge out in the reverse angle so that uh, the leg is shortened? No, so this dog, we're going to do an opening wedge, Robert. So we're going to actually make the leg a little bit more. Um, and so that's a, a good question. Um, if we were going to do a closing wedge, then effectively we would make the leg a little bit shorter. So if we look at these options for repair, we've talked about um, this opening wedge. And this is a fluoroscopic image that we've got um, over here of the, um, the opening wedge that we are wanting to create. Um, and what we're wanting to see on that, um, so the options for repair, so we, what we're going to do is open that wedge, we're going to make a transverse osteotomy and open that wedge up. So we have the, um, the long axis of the tibia, which is here in line with the, um, with the metatarsals. We generally, when we do that, try and maintain um, the fibula. Um, so we keep the fibula intact, or we actually try and maintain even just a very small section of the transportex there. And so that when we put our fixation on here, so we can do this either with a plate or a hybrid X fix, which we're gonna show you here. It means that if we put a plate on this side, and we put some screws across here and across here, we're gonna have actually pretty good load sharing with the bone because the transportex is intact and in most situations, we can actually maintain the fibula as well. And so, because the approach to the fibula is much, much easier from the lateral, uh, sorry, from the medial side, compared to the lateral side, we often will do this as an opening wedge rather than a closing wedge. Because if we're trying to do a closing wedge osteotomy from the medial side, so we're trying to make a, a wedge that is in this direction and then close that down, then we have to be cutting through the fibula as well to actually remove that section of fibula so we can close it down. So an opening wedge osteotomy is much more um, useful and, and versatile in this particular situation. So, you know, we could do a closed wedge, as you said. We're generally going to do an open. And then when we're doing an open wedge, we're going to look at our fixation option. And as I mentioned, we could do a plate or potentially we could look at a linear and hybrid. <laughs> Sound fix it up. Okay. So I'm just trying to find this chat box here we go. behind another window. So again, if you guys have questions, please sing them out to me. Um, if you want to comment on my Zoom skills, feel free to do that as well. Um, and if you want to just jot them down in the chat box, I'll work out how to open that up and we've got that there. So um, please do sing out any comments or questions as you go through. So we're going to get through, so I'll just look through this stuff. It's um, 
Again, not necessarily stuff that you're going to be doing in general practice. Just wanted to give you an approach and an appreciation of how you know, I would plan out this kind of angular incorrection and, and what's involved with this. Um, if you do an amount of orthopedic surgery, then these aren't hugely complicated surgeries for pes varus, especially because it's generally a, an angular correction that's in one plane. Um, and so there's often not a lot of rotational deformity or other things that you need to combat. So in terms of starting out with angular corrections, I think it's one that um, is certainly more straightforward compared to some of the antibrachial deformities that we deal with. So these are some images um, that we actually took with the fluoroscope. So the first one is just checking that we've got our alignment. Okay, this one over here. And then when we do these X fixes, the first thing we've got to do is remember to put the ring on the leg so that you can see the ring around the leg here. And then we're going to put the first pin that I've got as close to the joint as possible. And you can actually see, if I zoom in here, um, that that pin is, you know, it's a kind of a couple of millimetres from the um, articular surface. And so using the hybrid frame like this, we were able to get our um, distal fixation as close to the core as possible and make our osteotomy as close to the core as possible, but sometimes it's impossible to do it at the core. So the core can sometimes be actually right down here. And, you know, with any kind of fixation, there's not enough to hold on to. So we end up making our osteotomy a little bit higher up. So we, again, based on um, the core methodology and, and the rules associated with that, we are going to induce a little bit of translation. So that's the pin that's driven straight across. And when I'm planning this, I'm trying to get this pin um, basically 90 degrees to the metatarsals. So that once I've got my ring on there and I um, make my osteotomy and I straighten everything out, um, I'm going to have my ring essentially sitting perpendicular um, to the long axis of the bone there. So a few more images in this one here up in the top left. We've got the distal ring completely attached. We've got um, the two ring, uh, two wires across the bone. So one here and then we've got another one at the top. This one at the top is actually an olive wire that we put on there to stop the bone moving around within the ring construct. And then the second image that we've got here is me actually starting my osteotomy. So I'm using an... Um, a sagittal saw and you can see in the bone here I've started my osteotomy and I'm just making sure that I'm as close to the, um, the distal part of the joint as possible and as close to these implants so I'm only a couple of millimeters away from the um, a couple of millimeters away from the pin here and that's really as you know low down on the leg as you can get um, in my opinion or as safely get anyway and then over here what we've got is um, we've made our osteotomy through the bone and then we've gone ahead and we've opened that up and you can see now when I look at this, in surgery, I've got a visual clue that when I'm actually looking at the leg, I can see that the, um, the ring, which was on an angle, is now sitting straight and perpendicular to the long axis of the tibia. So I can look down the leg and get a nice visual clue um, and cue that, that it's nice and straight there. And so um, we're getting close to the point now. We've got that wedge opened up. We can see that the leg is looking kind of straight. Um, we're going to put some more fixation in there. So as I mentioned, on the medial aspect of the leg, we are going to go ahead and put um, a connecting bar. So that's this structure here. And then we're going to, we're actually using the drill here. You can see it's a drill bit just to drill um, our proximal hole um, for where our proximal pin is going to go. So what's a note here is that um, I actually inadvertently fractured the fibula in this dog. Um, that's quite easy to do if, when you're extending that leg, you either do it too rapidly or um, you do too much of a, um, an opening wedge, then you can fracture that fibula. It's not a disaster if that happens. It just means that the legs are a bit more unstable at that point. And you can see here that we have actually induced a little bit of translation. So we've got these, um, the bottom section of bone just here, and we've translated it a little bit that way. So um, what I actually ended up doing is, if you compare that to this one here, is actually bringing that um, leg back over to this medial side to kind of shore up that. Um, transported. Okay, that all kind of makes sense. Um, I can see Robert and I can see um, a couple of people here. If it's making sense, just give me a thumbs up. That'd be great. So the fixation that we've got then, we've got the ring at the bottom, we've got a medial connecting bar and then we've got two pins um, with four cortices in the top section. And in that um, size dog and in this situation, that's going to be plenty um, of fixation to get this to heal okay. Um, so this is the kind of the great shot that you want to get with all these corrections. You want to get the before and after. Um, so again, in the before shot, we've got the tibia here, we've got the metatarsals running down here. And the after shot, we've got the tibia here and the metatarsals and everything's nice and parallel. And you can see again that that ring that we put on here is basically perpendicular 
for that long axis of the TBF. Okay. Healing of these is actually pretty impressive. Um, this is a different case, um, one I prepared earlier. <laughs> Um, and so we can see in this dog, we've got the opening wedge, which was in here. Um, and that bone actually fills in really nicely. So when we make the osteotomy, we want to just irrigate the sore, keep the temperature down. Um, but these guys will be pretty much completely healed within eight weeks. Occasionally we'll have one that pushes out for 12 weeks. Um, and there's generally not a big issue with creating such a large, um, large wedge there. And so once we've taken the frame off, this is kind of what it looks like. Again, that leg's nice and straight. Um, and this dog's functioning much, much better. And you can see here we have induced a little bit of translation. So that, um, because we've made our cut in this dog, it's actually a little bit higher up. So the core would have been down here. We've made the cut higher up here. And so once we've actually um, corrected our angulation, we have actually translated this digital segment, a small amount, um, flatually, which is not a big deal for this one. How much wiggle would you get with something like a fixator like that at the fracture site? How much like movement? Yes. Yeah, that's a great question. So the nice thing about these ring fixators is that I think the reason that the bone healing is so great is that because of the ring structure, so you've got the ring on the outside and you've got the pins across, um, there is a little bit of what we call axial micromotion. So um, at the fracture side, if you have the um, fracture ends arbitrarily look like that, there's a little bit of micromotion in this axial kind of direction and that little bit of axial micromotion actually stimulates bone healing. If it's too much, it'll definitely retard the bone healing, but if it's a very, very small amount, it can actually stimulate the bone healing. So it's a really nice way to get these to, to heal um, well. And Zaroff was really onto something when he took a, a bike wheel and put some spokes through them to, um, to fix these in humans. He, um, he was on a winner for sure. So I really love the external fixes for that reason. And also for angular limb correction, the nice thing about this is that I can correct, and using an external fixer is that I can correct the um, angulation based on the x-rays and where I think the joint surfaces can go. And I can, you know, I can see how that um, is going to look in surgery, but it's really hard to sometimes assess what it's going to look like when the dog stands up and walks around on it when they're weight bearing. So with these, um, anti-breakthrough deformities where we've got a lot of rotation and then we've got valves. Um, you know, I can correct it as much as I think I need to, but once they actually stand up, we might actually decide, I oh, you know, need to rotate that a little bit more. And if I've got an external fixer on there, normally when the dog's coming at their one week check, I can actually adjust that and, and um, we can, you know, make further corrections to improve things. Um, so Nikki, as Nicole has just commented, was there a fracture of the fibula that happened during the correction of angulation or can that happen? Yes, there, there definitely was in this case, a, a small fracture that um, in the fibula that I actually created um, with the correction. And, and ideally you want to try and avoid that because it does provide a bit more construct stability, but it's not the end of the world. It's sometimes actually a little bit easier to get the correction um, if you do fracture the fibula. And you can induce a little bit of translation to counteract the, um, the effect of the core. So you guys don't have any more questions on that angle one. It's kind of just a bit of a gee whiz case to show you a little bit about how I would plan that out and to a little bit of the technology that we use and, and what's available for you guys as well. We'll move on to talking about um, something that comes up a lot. And, and at the moment for Vet Dojo, I'm putting together a course on medial patella luxation. Um, and as I started doing it, I realized that there's quite a lot to kind of cover. And there is a bit of a discussion in that about how we would potentially manage um, medial patelluxation and cranial cruciate ligament disease um, when it occurs at the same time. And, and that can be a real, um, it's a common situation and it can be a very challenging situation and there's not necessarily a right or wrong way to actually manage those. Um, and so the approach that I'm going to go through is kind of my approach. Everyone is going to have a different opinion on it. Um, it's like everything that's said is a lot of opinions and, and this one is one that is definitely um, you know, a lot of controversy out there potentially and everyone has a, a different way of looking at it. So I'll give you my approach anyway. So put this picture on here because, you know, sometimes medial patelluxation, crucial disease, they can really go hand in hand. So just to review a little bit of the anatomy, um, this was an interesting case. So these images were kind of a, a gee whiz case as well. So this was actually a 40 kilo um, three-legged dog, which is a pelvic limb amputee. Um, and this is the good back leg. So this dog presented with 
Cruise shoot disease, um, you had a very unstable um, cruise shoot. He's got a lot of effusion in this joint. Um, he had a lot of cranial draw, so this tibia was really just kind of um, flapping in the breeze this way. And then you can see on the x-ray here that the is sitting in a funny spot. Um, and he also had a grade three luxation. So you can see on the CT scan um, that that patella is sitting medial um, and causing this skull um, some problems. So let's get rid of this. Uh, So the anatomy, I just want to review with you guys. Um, obviously, when we're dealing with the cruciate ligament, we um, have that kind of running in this direction just here. Um, and sorry, a few phone calls here. Um, we have the patella tendon tracking down here. We'll come back and look at some of the anatomy um, in a little bit more time. But I just wanted to kind of highlight to you that um, when we're fixing these, there's a whole bunch of things that we need to try and account for. And when we're looking at this anatomy, one of the things that contribute largely to the internal rotation and the, the fact that when a dog has a patella luxation and also rupture of the crucial, when a dog has a um, underlying patella luxation, the crucial ligament become a problem, is that when the crucial ligament actually is injured, the crucial ligament runs this direction. When the crucial ligament is injured, we can actually get then more internal rotation of the tibia. Okay, and that internal rotation of the tibia can then pull the patella out from where it needs to be. So this dog, I put this CT image in here because this was a classic one where um, we have the femur that's relatively straight down here. And we look at the tibia here and we can actually see that it's internally rotating. It's actually pulling the tibia over. Now, I'm just gonna try and Fine, if I've got this up here. I'm not going to find that very easily. I can probably just work off these images here. Um, I'm going to show you the 3D model there and, and just kind of move that around, but I don't think it's absolutely critical in this particular case. Um, and this is, a, I guess, another part of this discussion I wanted to have with you about um, crucial disease and, and how we actually um, treat these when there's a patelloxation is that there's a subset of dogs that presented about, um, I would say, as a mature adult, so anywhere from kind of two years plus, and they present for the first time, um, you know, at two, three, four, five, whatever years, and you have a look at them and you notice the first thing you see is that they've got a patelloxation. Um, and I just wanted to kind of make you guys aware of the fact that if this dog's been completely asymptomatic from, you know, the day the owner's had it as a puppy, the five years of age, and all of a sudden it's presenting with a back leg um, it's and they've got a patelloxation, you should have it in your mind to really check carefully whether the crucial is also a problem. Because in my experience, um, the, the patelloxation in those cases can be sometimes somewhat of an incidental finding. And the underlying problem is actually the crucial ligament disease. And so if that's the case, then, you know, when you're making decisions on how to manage that, in some situations, you can make the case about, well, let's just fix the cruise ship first and then get back, get the dog back to where it was um, before it actually had the cruise ship injury. And so that dog might then have a low grade patelloxation, but that might not actually be um, the biggest problem for that particular case. And so the decision making around how to manage these, I think there's a lot of factors to consider. Um, I think that you need to look at the age of the dog, the breed of the dog, um, how active this dog is, what are the expectations of the owners, what do the owners want to do, because as we go through in a second, there's a whole bunch of different ways that we can, we can fix this. And so for me, um, I, I do have in my mind, you know, if I'm going to do a repair, am I thinking of, first of all, am I going to fix both conditions at the same time? So I'm going to fix the crucial ligament and am I going to fix the patella at the same time? Or am I going to just focus on the crucial ligament first and get the dog back to where it was before the crucial became a problem? Does that make sense to everyone, what I'm trying to get at there? Yeah. So, the options we've got for treatment, um, I think the least aggressive thing we can do in most situations is going to be a combination of an extra capsule of suture. Pick your poison with that one. Um, and then combining that with a tibial crest transposition. And I 
don't often do that approach anymore. I used to do that more with smaller breed dogs um, before I started doing TPLOs in those little guys um, much more commonly. But I think if you're not performing um, an osteotomy procedure like a TPLO, then combining the extra capsule of suture with a tibial crest transposition is a fairly um, safe way of correcting both problems. Um, when you start looking at modifications of the osteotomy procedures like a TPLO, then things can become much more complicated and the stakes can be quite a lot higher. So that's the first option that we've got. We'll talk about some details of that in a second. The second option that we've got is um, to say, well, you know, we know that if it was just the cruciate ligament, that an extra capsule repair is not necessarily the best way to fix that. And so we want to try and um, correct this problem with an osteotomy, and I'm going to use the example of a TPLO because that's the one I do the most of. So we want to do a TPLO for the, um, for the cruciate, but then how do we also combat um, the medial patel luxation? There's a different, couple of different ways to do that. So if we do the TPLO, um, how can we also then um, modify that to address the, um, to address the medial patel luxation? And, and I'll talk through a couple of options for that in a second. One of them is with a... Um, a medial translation of the proximal segment, which I'll talk through, and that's my preferred option. Especially in little guys, I think that works quite well. And the other option is to do a combination, so we can add in the yeah, tibial crest transposition as well. But when we do a TPLO and a tibial crest transposition at the same time, I've only done that in one case, um, because I think we've got other options that work well. I think that's a, a higher stakes and a potentially um, higher risk things to, to, try and, um, to try and achieve. And so I'm always kind of thinking with them doing these procedures, you know, what's the risk versus what's the benefit? And if the risk profile is really, really big, I'm trying to look at whether, whether there's another surgical option that we want to look at. The third option that we've got, as we just talked about, is to assess the patient carefully and decide, you know, is the metalluxation just kind of this red herring diagnosis been there forever, but not really a problem. We're only noticing it now because the cruciate's ruptured and all of a sudden we've got this internal rotation of the tibia. We've also got more joint fluid, and so the, um, the femoral patella joint is now kind of pushed out, and so the, the patella is not actually constrained by the trochlear groove to the same degree. So all those things can contribute to the tendency for the patella to luxate. Um, and so the third option there is to just do the um, crucial repair first. and then come back and do the tibial crest transposition in the future if we need to. Because when we're managing patella luxation, you know, even if I do a tibial crest transposition in a dog and it's just the patella, if it's a grade three luxation, it comes back as a grade one after the surgery, we may not necessarily jump straight back into that to do more surgery on that particular case if the clinical signs are fairly mild. Um, there's other options there. So um, the TTA, which is the tibial tuberosity advancement, that can lend itself quite nicely to um, also lateralization of that tibial crest. And I've done plenty of those procedures where we do the TTA and we actually lateralize it at the same time. Um, and I think that can work quite well. But as a general procedure, um, I've really gone away from doing TTAs. Um, I really don't do any TTAs anymore. I think if there's a crucial problem, I'm going to do a TPLO 99.9% um, .9 of the time. Um, I think there's no question that those guys do better clinically in my hands in all size of dogs. And that's even down to, you know, one and a half, two kilo dogs, right to the 90 kilo dogs. And then, so I'm just looking at whether there's a way that I can actually combine that tibio, tibio procedure with another procedure to address the, um, to address the patella luxation at the same time. So if we're going to do an extra capsular repair and a tibial crest transposition, there's a couple of things you need to pay attention to. And so I've just got my x-ray here. On this x-ray, we want to position our tibial crest um, osteotomy. We're going to basically want to try and have as big a tibial crest as we possibly can here. And so when we make our osteotomy, we're going to try and um, bring that back and we're going to plan to have this osteotomy in front of this location here. Okay. You've got to remember that the articular surface for the tibia is way back here. Okay. So that's the articular surface. That's where it finishes. And so it's safe, completely safe, to have your osteotomy anywhere in this location here. We don't want to get much further behind this point here because we're going to have another structure that runs in this area here, which is called the long digital extensor tendon. Okay, and so we don't want to impinge on the long digital extensor tendon. 
we want to have our osteotomy sitting kind of just in front of that. So we've got the tubular girdy, which is going to be right there. We're going to put our osteotomy along this line, just in front of tubular girdy, just in front of the long digital extensor tendon that runs here. And so I'll actually then, using a program like VPOP or um, on your x-rays, I'll actually measure what this distance is here. So I know off the tip of tuberosity exactly where my osteotomy is going to go. And I'm also going to measure this distance here so I know what length my osteotomy is going to be. Another thing I'm going to do is pay really careful attention to what the general morphology of the proximal tibia looks like because it's really, really common that, you know, or every dog or cat has a, a slightly different tibial morphology and it's quite different how that tibial press looks. And knowing what it looks like before you actually get into surgery can really help to make sure that you don't get lost and you don't make a mistake with where your osteotomy is actually positioned. So that's the first thing. We want to make sure we're taking a nice big piece of the tibial press when we're doing our um, tibial press transposition. And then when we're doing our extra capsular repair, um, we've got isometric points that we want to focus on. And the isometric points that we want to look at, so there's one here on the lateral femur, um, it's just in front of the fabella. So you could either go around the fabella if you wanted to, or you can go through a bone tunnel in this location. Um, those two are fairly close by and, and not such a, an issue of, of variance, but when we're looking at this, this, this um, attachment point in the proximal tibia, that's when um, I find a, a lot of areas can be made, and then this is looking at a lot of x-rays from a lot, of, a lot of different vets out there that do extra capture repairs. The ideal location to have um, the extra capsular repair anchor point is just here, um, just um, in that region of the extensor tendon, either just behind it or just in front of it or right underneath the extensor tendon. And if you don't have that um, insertion point or attachment point for the cruciate ligament repair, then you're going to have that um, suture that you put in there, they're becoming tight or loose as that joint moves through a range of motion. And, and most people um, or a lot of general practitioners, when I see these um, attachment points, they're, they're all over the place. Sometimes they're right here, sometimes they're down here, sometimes they're down here. And they're really nowhere near close to the, the point of isometry. So it's really important to try and if you're going to have good results um, with an extra cap repair, try and get that suture point as close to the, the isometric point as possible. And I point this out because if you have um, your isometric point too far cranial or too far distal, then you, when you make your osteotomy, you won't be able to use that um, point through the tibial crest as the attachment point for the suture. So you need to have it in that um, proper isometric location to be able to get a nice size tibial press to rotate it over and then also be able to make a hole in the tibia for a bone tunnel for a bone end cap. And so if we're combining those two techniques, the TCT and the crucial ligament repair, and we're going to have the suture running um, in this location here, then you want to make sure that it's that, that point on the tibia is actually behind where you're making that osteotomy. So that's the, the, the main things I want to think about there. The second thing I want to go through is then just this modification of the TPLO um, that I do um, if I'm trying to address both of these issues of the crucian of the patella ligament, uh, sorry, patella luxation. And this again is a tripod dog, 40 kilos, he's only got one back leg, um, and that one is a bit of a mess. So I talked to the owners about different options to do this. This is a repair, incidentally, I would normally do this kind of repair in smaller dogs, quite happily um, do them all the time. So dogs about 15 kilos, um, it's quite... Um, a good option to just translate this proximal segment of the tibia here relative to the distal segment down here. Okay, so we can see the amount of translation that we've actually achieved in this location just here. And what that has done by actually pulling the proximal segment of the TPLO, oops, so by pulling this segment here of the TPLO, we're pulling it medially, so pulling it towards the plate, what we've actually done is we've left the attachment point of the cruciate, uh, sorry, of the patella tendon, this tibial crest, we've actually moved that laterally. So we've effectively achieved a tibial crest translation. Okay, and so this modification where we pull that over, and in this dog, that amount there is actually about a centimetre. Okay, so we've moved that proximal segment of bone about a centimetre, and so effectively, we have translated the tibial crest about a centimetre. And that was enough in this dog to get the patella um, lined up and, and sitting where it needs to go. Okay. And so in this case, I've kind of an interesting one because this modification of the TPLO, I'm quite happy to do in smaller breed dogs. I've always hesitated from doing it in a larger breed dog because you know, I'm not sure you know, how much these plates can withstand. 
Um, this is a fix and plate incidentally. So this plate is really nice because it's got a really long section between this hole here um, and the three proximal holes here. But there's a lot of room here, a lot of scope, and I can actually bend this plate. So I've actually made this bend in the plate um, with plate benders in the surgery. The other option that we've got as a modification in larger breed dogs is to... Um, sorry, I'm just going to get rid of these lines. Is to perform a typical crest transposition at the same time. And so what we can do here is actually make an osteotomy in this location here. So we've got an osteotomy here, and then we've got an osteotomy here. And then we have a third segment of bone in here, which we can actually translate independently of the rest of the construct. And so once we've translated that piece of bone, um, the way that I fix that is to put a headless compression screw um, across here um, to hold that in place. So we've got our osteotomy down here, we've got our osteotomy here, we've got a headless compression screw across here, and that'll hold things in there really, really nicely. We can also put a tension band on there if we think we need to for some extra support. And so in larger breed dogs, I think that is a, a good option. I went backwards and forwards with these owners about this particular case because the stakes are fairly high. You know, this dog only had one back leg um, and we needed to try and correct everything in the most straightforward way possible. So um, looking at the different options for, for modification rather than doing a three piece TPLO, as I call it, I just went with a conventional TPLO with modified by translating that proximal segment. Um, and that dog ultimately has gone and done really, really nicely. Um, what you can also do at the same time with all these repairs, so if you're combining an extra capsule of suture um, with a tibial crest transposition or if you're doing a modified TPLO, is at the same time we can do a trocleoplasty and we can also do our soft tissue repairs. So we might need to do a medial release if it's a grade three or four luxation. Um, or lateral um, implication at the same time. So all those adjunctive treatments um, can be very, very useful to help get that patella tracking where it needs to go. But these are um, potentially challenging cases um, when there's a combination and there's a lot of factors to, to take into account when we're dealing with them. Um, you know, generally for small dogs, it's a no-brainer for me. I'm going to do a TPLO with a, a modification where we lateralize um, the distal segment or medialize the proximal segment. Um, in larger breed dogs, it can be a three-piece TPLO. Um, any size dog, if, you, if you're not doing TPLO procedures, then we can look at doing um, an extra capsule and a tibial press transposition as well. And then that final scenario that we talked about, so these older dogs that present for the first time with their lame, um, and they've got both the patella and the cruciate, um, it's worth asking the question about whether that dog's been lame at all in the past, because if it hasn't, and now it's just got this you know, lameness due to the cruciate ligament, which is often a different lameness as well. So, with a patella luxation, they've got that characteristic hopping type lameness, but um, when they've got the crucial ligament involved, it's often more typically um, an intermittent progressive lameness. It's worse after exercise, it's worse when they first get up, um, but it's there generally all the time rather than just being, you know, a very intermittent pace, skip for a few steps, and then they're completely fine in between times. So, any of you guys have any questions about that? Um, the big, um, a bit to get through in that kind of topic, and I've kind of just scratched the surface there just to give you guys a bit of food for thought. So you just feel free to sing out if you have any questions or um, just to throw a wrench in. What if the patient has some degree of patella alta? That's a great question. Um, at another case recently, so there's a that's a question from Dylan Scott. He said, just to throw a wrench in there, what happens if this patient has a degree of patella alta? Um, incidentally, if you guys select um, the option, I think you can select to um, post those comments privately or to everyone. If you're happy for everyone to see them, um, then just put it, um, change your comments setting and you can and have everyone see those comments. Um, if the patient has patella alta as well and we feel like the patella alta is a contributing factor to the luxation, then we can either do a closing wedge osteotomy. Um, so if we just erase this stuff here. So we could do, actually go back a couple of slides to the clean x-ray. To this one here. So we could do if we had a patella alpha. So patella alpha is when the patella sits up too high. Okay. And so when it's sitting up high like that, when the stifle's an extension. So if we had this stifle fully extended with the, the femur sitting up more this direction, um, then the patella can sometimes sit up above the trochlear groove. And if it does that, then it's a higher chance of luck saving. So this is a really good question. So if it's sitting up too high, what do we do? One option that we've got, um, or what are the options, I guess, to try and 
distalize that that tibial crest. One is to do an osteotomy and pull the whole lot distal. Um, but if you've got a cruciate ligament rupture at the same time, um, then we've got another couple of ways we can be a bit more tricky about it. The other way that we can manage it is to do a closing wedge osteotomy. So we actually do the um, original kind of TPLO, which is the closing wedge. And we actually take out this wedge of bone here. And that will effectively distalize the tibial crest and, and pull that patella down a little bit. So I do that occasionally. The other way that I do this more commonly is um, with a procedure called a CBLO, which is a core base leveling osteotomy. And so rather than doing the TPLO where the cut goes like this, the CBLO, the cut actually goes in this direction here. And we actually rotate this section approximately that way relative to the, the distal aspect of the tibia. And in doing that, we can also distalize quite effectively um, the attachment point of the tibial sorry, the patella tendon, that to your tuberosity, and we can get that patella tracking a bit better in the chocolate group. And so both of those options are, um, are a possibility. Um, if we're doing those, again, we have to then make a decision about whether we need to do a tibial crest transposition as well, or whether just discalizing the patella is gonna be adequate. And I think it's worth noting as well, in these large breed dogs, it's always worth carefully assessing whether they have any femoral changes that can contribute to the patella luxation. So do they have a femoral virus um, or do they have any femoral torsion which can contribute? Because in these large breed dogs, when they have medial patella luxation, femoral virus, femoral torsion are more common, um, I think, than in little dogs. And that can make it, um, a big difference in how you actually plan these out and treat those. Because if they've got a, a, a massive um, bow in the femur distally, then actually straightening out the femur um, you might be able to get the patella tracking adequately just doing that. So, you know, you could do a distal femoral osteotomy and a TPLO, for instance, to try and correct that particular situation. Um, that's a great question. Um, so, anyone else got any comments or questions on that? There's a bit to get through, as I said there. Okay, one is shouting out anything at the moment. So we'll move on then to the next set of slides that I've got. So it's 10 to three. So um, we might have to leave this final surgery stuff till next time. Um, but I do want to chat to you guys about intestinal surgery. This is relevant to everyone in um, general practice. I'm sure um, if you're doing any surgery, intestinal surgery is one of the things that's um, on the agenda. So this is um, a dog that's got a septic abdomen. Um, so a bit of a mess in there, a lot of, um, you know, just frank pus, we've got um, kind of intestinal contents, that kind of stuff in here. Um, but a lot of just pus in there um, and a bit of a mess, really. A lot of fibrin clots, um, everything kind of bunched up together with intestines. So these are cases, and I'm not going to talk from intestinal surgery start to finish here. I really just want to focus on kind of the challenging, challenging situation, the kind of 10 out of 10 situation where you've got this septic peritonitis and you've got to try and work out ways to, to deal with that and options to try and manage that. Because when we're dealing with um, intestinal surgery, dehiscence is a problem. Um, and the risk of dehiscence is much, much higher if we have a pre-existing peritonitis, okay? So dehiscence with surgical um, intestinal surgery, it's interesting. Um, when you look way back when in the literature, the rate of intestinal dehiscence for biopsies, enterotomies, and anastomoses ran about 10%. And I was looking at some recent papers um, and they were looking at barbed sutures and comparing the barbed sutures, which are not the sutures, to conventional sutures with rates of intestinal dehiscence. And what was interesting, these are recent studies that come out in the last couple of years, is that the rates of dehiscence were still the same. They're about kind of 10% um, there or thereabouts across the board. So, you know, even with modern technology and all this kind of stuff and best technique, if you're doing enough intestinal surgery, my point is that you're going to see um, in the intestinal leakage at some point. Okay, and I'd argue that if you haven't seen intestinal leakage, um, you probably haven't done enough intestinal surgery yet. Okay, um, and you don't want to smite the surgery guys because if you do, that's surely enough. The next case you see, it's, it's going to leak. Okay, and this is definitely intestinal surgery is one of those things you know, talk about taking care of the one percenters and trying to um, adhere to health service principles as carefully as possible because if you can you know, take care of those one percenters across the board on every case, then you're going to improve the outcomes. Um, by and large, on a, on, not on every case, but you're going to help to improve the outcomes in a larger percentage of the cases that you treat. So dehiscence, as I said, 7 to 15%, around 10% is the number I have in my mind for dehiscence. That's the number I talk to owners about when I do this kind of surgery. The problem with dehiscence is that if they dehisce and you get that septic peritonitis, 
um, that is a bad situation because the mortality rate is somewhere between 50 to 75 percent. So those numbers are pretty big. I put this image in here because when these guys do leak, um, it's often the anti-mesenteric aspect of the intestine, uh, sorry, the mesenteric aspect of the intestine that they leak from. So you've got the blood vessels, everything coming in here, and this mesenteric aspect is often where um, it's harder to get accurate suture placement. So I think that's one of the reasons that they leak there. There's often a lot more fat around the serosal surface. And so one thing that I do when I actually do this surgery is I'll actually just kind of peel back that fat a little bit, just take it away from the edge of the intestine a couple of millimetres so I can at least see very clearly where that intestinal edge is and, and really focus on getting accurate suture placement at that area. I'll also try not to have any knots there. So often I do intestinal surgery with two or three runs of um, a continuous suture. So if we have the intestine cross-section like that and then we've got it kind of coming down like this, I'll either um, triangulate this so We'll do it in three runs, kind of like that. So one section of continuous, one section continuous, one section continuous. Um, or the other option that um, you've got is just to do it in two runs, so one on each side. But my point is when we do that, if we've got um, the mesentery coming in here along this line there, I don't want to have my knot right where the mesentery is. I want to have my knot sitting off to the side here. And so um, I can see where it is, I can get it nice and um, in a, a nice clear area of intestine, get good security, and then I can come past that mesenteric aspect with my um, run of sutures and, and get more accurate tissue placement. So I just want to put a couple of slides in here about diagnosing a leak. Um, and um, one option that we've got is to, um, to put a drain into the abdomen essential. I'm just going to skip through these slides. So when we diagnose a leak, we can do different things. We can look at putting a needle in the abdomen, we can put a catheter in there, we can do a diagnostic peritoneal lavage, we can use ultrasound to try and take a sample of fluid, all these things are possible. Um, but one of the things that works quite nicely, um, I have to give credit to Charles who's sitting there, I'm not sure if he's listening or not, this is a test what he's listening. Um, response, um, is that we put a um, Jackson Pratt drain into um, the abdomen and that Jackson Pratt drain um, it enables us to just have a, a clear picture inside the abdomen. I think this is really useful for the cases when, you know, I put this in, every time I go into the viscous, I'm going to put an, a, 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 lap, a Jackson Pratt drain in there because most of the time, if you have a Labrador that comes in, it's in a corn cob and you take the corn cob out, you do the surgery, generally the next day that dog's eating and drinking and doing well. And you know that you're in good shape because the dog's eating and drinking. In some situations, that 24 to 48 hours after surgery, the dogs are better. You know, they're not, 100%, they're not wanting to eat, they're licking some food, but then they're spitting it back out again, they're a bit nauseous. And those are challenging cases because you, in the back of your mind, you're wondering, you know, is that dog potentially leaking again now? Is it just that it was quite sick beforehand and it's taking a bit longer to recover? You know, what's the reason for it just not being quite right? And they're really hard to know what the best thing to do is, you know, do you just give them more time? Do you go back in there surgically and explore them to make sure they're not leaking? Um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a real gray area, I find. And so, you know, you can also always ultrasound them and try and identify if there's fluid there, but the accuracy of those tests, those tests relies on there being, you know, an amount of fluid there, which is already kind of quite a ways down in the disease course. Um, also relies on being able to get a sample of um, the fluid that is representative of the underlying process. So by putting a Jackson Pratt drain into the abdomen, it stays in there for um, as long as it needs to, and, and you can basically remove fluid from that abdomen at any point. And you know that the fluid you take out of there is going to be more likely to be generally representative of the, of the fluid in the abdomen as a whole. And if you're not getting much fluid out, you can do a flush and, and take the cells out and have a look. You do need to be mindful of the fact that um, when you have these drains in the abdomen, the fluid that sits in the drain, so when you actually drain out the fluid, the first kind of four or five mils that you take out, you just want to throw that in the bin because that fluid that's been sitting in the tube is going to have a lot of really angry degenerate nutrients. So you want to just get rid of that and then I would take the next sample of fluid and then analyze that. And what you find is that when you analyze that every 12 hours, for instance, um, that you will see initially quite a large number of neutrophils in there because there's inflammatory response, there's peritonitis there, it's fairly mild. But at each time point, each 12 hours, that the number of neutrophils drops down quite significantly at each point. And so if I'm monitoring a dog after surgery and I see those neutrophils come down, all of a sudden they jump straight back up and there's a lot more neutrophils there, I know that at that point, there's a problem. And every time I've identified that, I've gone back into the abdomen and I've found a leak. And I've been really happy that I've gone back in because that leak was very early on. 
I haven't waited four or five days for that, um, that case to be very, very unwell and very, very unstable um, before we start. We've actually addressed the problem much earlier on in the disease course. So rather than getting the peritonitis completely out of hand, we managed to hit it on the head much, much earlier. So I think it's a really valuable tool to have. It's something you can use in general practice. Um, it's very, very easy to assess and, and understand what's going on there. Um, and so with that, I, when I'm looking at that fluid, the other point I just want to make is when I take that fluid out, I don't necessarily spin the fluid down and then look at the sediment. I just take the fluid um, as it is and I just put a drop on the microscope slide and I look at that. And, you know, in general, you're going to have on, you know, per high power field, I haven't actually done the numbers on it, but you might have 10 to 12 neutrophils per high power field to start and then it drops down pretty quickly to one or two. Um, and then you're looking at the dog clinically, how they're going. Um, if those neutrophils jump up and all of a sudden it's ball ball neutrophils on there, you know that there's something going on that you potentially need to have a look at. The other comment I'm going to make is just relating to um, the lag phase of intestinal healing. So normally we talk about the weakest point of healing of the intestine being two to three days after surgery. Um, these guys often don't leak, you know, they don't just get to that lag point and then start leaking at that point. In my, my opinion, they start leaking straight away. Um, they, it takes a few days often to pick it up because they've been leaking a little bit, but the dogs aren't unwell enough yet. It hasn't caused enough of a systemic problem. So this jack complaint train that's in the abdomen, I think it's just a really nice early warning signal if there's a, a problem in there that we need to deal with. That's the first tip I just wanted to go through. Um, there's a question there from friends. Um, where do you place the drain? And the drain basically just goes straight into the abdomen. So I put it in like a chest drain, normally have it kind of go through the skin, just goes paramedian, so just adjacent to the abdominal incision. I just make a stabbing incision in the skin, tunnel it in the sub-Q for a couple of centimetres and drop it into the abdomen. I just sit right in there, okay? Um, and yeah, very straightforward to maintain and, and look after. I think you need to use a Jackson Pratt drain because um, the Jackson Pratt drain has all those little fenestrations in there and it's unlikely to get blocked up by momentum. Um, I also think it's important not to have um, continual negative pressure applied to that drain um, when you're assessing that. So we're getting close to three o'clock. The final thing I just wanted to go through with you is um, kind of an out there idea. And um, again, I've got to give credit to Charles for this idea. Um, this is something that they do in people um, for colonic surgery. And we had a dog many years ago, um, golden retriever, that had had, I think, three or four exploratory laparotomies um, with recurrent septic peritonitis. The dog was in a really poor shape before we started, um, had multiple uh, risk factors for peritonitis, it had low albumin, um, and it had hypertension, it had the um, pre existing peritonitis, and then the, the reason for doing surgery was intestinal corn, corn cob or foreign body. And so what we decided to do um, was rather than have the anastomosis which we've got sitting here, try and heal in the general abdominal environment where there's a lot of um, really kind of harsh peritoneal enzymes and, and problems in there, we actually exteriorized that intestinal segment from the abdomen. So we've made a small incision. So this is our midline incision down here. We've made a small incision adjacent, so parasagittal to the midline. Um, that's about probably four or five centimeters in length. And then we've actually just kind of pulled that intestinal segment into the subcutaneous pocket that we've created. Um, and we've actually put a crucian suture underneath that just to kind of hold it out there. We've gone ahead and we've flushed out the rest of the abdomen. We've done what we needed to do in there. Then we've closed the abdomen. We've put a Jackson Pratt drain in. And then we've left this intestinal anastomosis in the subcutaneous pocket there um, for about three days. And that three day period was enough time for the um, peritonitis to get under control. And once we had documented the peritonitis was kind of settling down, we actually did another surgical procedure and we released that incision there, uh, released those sutures and we actually dropped that intestinal segment back down into the abdomen. Um, and that dog went on to do really well. I've done that a couple of times since. Um, and it's a real nice kind of get out of jail free card if you like. It's a, an option that's a bit out there. It does take a bit of looking after afterwards. Um, but it's an a interesting technique that's something to be done in general practice potentially um, and can be something that's kind of out there at least just to help manage these really, really challenging situations. Um, the other options you've got to try and augment the repair with intestinal surgery in that perineal environment is things like a um, serosal patch um, or even a mentalization. But if there's a real ripping peritonitis there, you know, you want to go for the serosal patch, I don't think your mental is going to do enough. Um, but even better than that, if you can actually remove the intestine from that environment to get it to heal, then that um, will actually work really, really nicely as well. 
Uh, how do you hold the, the, the loop of gut in the subcutaneously without cutting the blood supply? Yeah, good question. So we've just got a, a fairly loose cruciate suture. So we use quite big suture, number two nylon. Um, and that just kind of runs between um, between the kind of cut edges there of the abdominal wall. So that goes kind of between the mesentery. And between, so the, the mesentery is coming up and the suture is going to go between. Yep. And it's not quite tight. Um, it's just kind of held there loosely so the intestine can sit there and the blood supply is able to be maintained. And then the okay. drop down procedure is what it's called, is that you actually just cut that suture, pull it out, and the intestine drops down in the abdomen when you're done. Yep. So good question. So it is three o'clock, um, and probably finish up in the next couple of minutes. So I hope you guys found that useful. I'm sorry about the technical um, kind of challenges at the start. As I say, we're just testing out some different platforms for doing this. I think Zoom ultimately is probably the best way to, um, to keep going with these. And um, for some reason, my iPad just wouldn't share with my PC, so that set us back a little bit at the start. So I do apologize for that, and thank you for your patience. So if uh, you guys don't have any more questions, um, I think we'll finish up. Um, if you guys have any um, kind of requests on things you want to hear from us, in these Q&A sessions, they're kind of just designed to be rapid fire, a um, couple of points about cases, not you know full discussions about um, every aspect of a particular disease, just how to deal with some different clinical situations. Certainly feel free to send them through and Charles and I'll be doing these each week. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions on that, let us know. Um, if you're interested in um, Vet Dojo, please get on and, and have a look at vetdojo.com and, and see what we're doing over there. If you um, are not aware, we have our um, YouTube channel, um, on, uh, which is Southpaw's YouTube channel. And we've got a lot of live streaming that we do there with surgery. Um, so if you're interested in that kind of stuff, then you can get onto YouTube, just Google Southpaw's and you can subscribe to the channel. Um, and also you can join us on Facebook. And if you join a closed group on Facebook, we're kind of putting up updates about what's going on with the Dojo and also with the YouTube channel. So yeah, that's pretty much it. So thank you very much for your time. Nice to see some faces there, some familiar faces. Thanks, guys. Thanks for joining us from internationally. It's great to have you guys on board. Um, hopefully the time difference isn't killing anyone too much. Um, but, yeah, thanks for coming on.